Welcome to Comics Crash Course. So last week we discussed the first part of the Silver Age, when DC Comics managed to reignite interest in superhero comics by redesigning and reimagining Golden Age heroes and putting them into new fantastic stories drawn in a streamlined house style headed by talented artists like Kurt Swan, Carmine Infantino, and Gil Kane. But the second half of the Silver Age, it's all about Marvel. Marvel Comics as we know it was actually created in the Silver Age, but its roots go back to 1939, well in the Golden Age, when magazine and pulp novel publisher Martin Goodman founded Timely Comics. His first comic was Marvel Comics number one, which introduced the characters the Human Torch, who is different than Johnny Storm, and Namor the Submariner, the same guy who's still around in his tiny shorts. Goodman was looking to cash in on the comics craze, and though his publishing model was more focused on following trends and jumping on bandwagons, he'd end up with one of the coolest set of creators in the Golden Age, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon. It was Timely who published the Golden Age Captain America. In fact, Goodman hired Joe Simon to be the company's first comics editor. It didn't last long, though. Simon and Kirby left after a dispute over Captain America in 1941, and in a search for his replacement, Goodman appointed his wife's cousin, who had then been an office boy, as temporary editor. Young Stanley Leibowitz, who we all know better as Stan Lee, did well, and soon the position became permanent. In fact, Lee became editor-in-chief and art director for Goodman's comics publications. The fad following, rather than trend-setting characteristic of these years, became most apparent around 1950, when Timely completely stopped producing superhero comics. They also changed their name at this point to Atlas Comics. When westerns were big, Atlas made westerns. When horror comics were the big wave, they made horror. But they stopped real quick when it was a problem. Perhaps their most blatant attempts at trend following were in regards to Archie and Casper the Ghost. In 1953, Atlas launched Homer Hoover, followed by 1955's Homer the Happy Ghost. In the mid-1950s, Atlas launched a bunch of catch-all mystery and suspense titles that told a wide range of weird stories, sort of like the Twilight Zone would in the 1960s. Though these titles, like Tales of Suspense, Journey into Mystery, and Strange Tales, would later be related to some of your favorite superhero titles, in this era, they were frequently a source of great monster stories, like the creatures in the B-movies you'd catch at a drive-in theater. In fact, it's in Tales to Astonish number 13, published in 1960, that Groot appears for the first time, though he's not quite the same Groot you know and love. It's also around this time that Steve Ditko joins the company from Charlton, and Jack Kirby returns to the company. In 1959, Atlas changes its name again to Marvel Comics. It still wasn't quite the Marvel you know, and by 1961, Marvel was practically dead on arrival. After 20 years with the company, Stanley was thinking about changing careers. The publisher Martin Goodman had seen the success of superheroes at DC, and particularly the success of the new Justice League comic, and told Lee to make a superhero group. Lee's wife Joan encouraged him to try, but told him to tell the story the way he wanted to not just what he thought might sell. So, we got together with Jack Kirby, and they came up with something. The Fantastic Four. Unlike a lot of the DC superheroes at that point, the four were real people with real problems in the real world, our world. They lived in the Baxter Building in New York City. They were a family who loved each other, but also bickered. They were inspiring individuals, but they were also flawed and complex. And their powers brought them as much grief as they did joy. The FF was a huge hit. Following the basic formula set up by the Fantastic Four, that Marvel superheroes would have real problems, complex emotions, and struggle with their powers, Lee and the Marvel artists, particularly Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, began to create a universe. In May of 1962, Hulk appeared. In August of 62, Thor and Spider-Man followed. In September of 62, Ant-Man. 1963 saw Iron Man, Nick Fury, Doctor Strange, and the X-Men join the universe. And 63 is also the year that the Avengers first teamed up, which also included the Wasp. In 1964, Captain America was brought back from the ice, and Daredevil was created. And in 1966, Black Panther appeared for the first time in the pages of Fantastic Four. So in addition to a lot of villains and minor characters, a good three quarters of the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe as it stands today was created in one studio by a handful of excited dudes in five years. <sighs> Marvel's lineup was a huge success. And by the late 1960s, superhero comic books were once again a legitimate industry. So how were they able to do this? Part of it is what's known as the Marvel Method, a storytelling and creation technique that was used by Marvel at this time. 
and it existed before 1961 and the creation of the Fantastic Four, and was likely created to deal with the absolutely tiny budget Marvel Comics had, and the limited time the studio had to produce books. It worked like this. The writer and the artist, and the writer at this time was usually Stan Lee, would work together to come up with story characters and ideas. The artist would then go away and draw the whole issue, without any script. After submitting the drawn pages, the writer would then fill in the caption and dialogue to guide the story for the reader. The pages would then be submitted for printing, and that's the book. So this is one of the reasons it's difficult to say who's actually involved in creating many of these characters. It really was a team effort, and no one was tracking who said what or when. There are a huge number of people involved in Marvel Studios throughout the Silver Age, all of whom deserve a ton of credit. But I only have so much time, and you can't talk about the Marvel Revolution without giving a little extra focus to Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby. Jack and Stan were the team that worked on the Fantastic Four, the Avengers crew, and the X-Men. Stan and Steve created Doctor Strange and Spider-Man. Ditko joined Atlas Comics in 1956. He's famously reclusive and reticent, and so we don't know a lot about him personally. However, what we do know is that he was great at exaggerated emotion and spindly, anxious human forms. As such, his work is perfect for Spider-Man. And in particular, he made Spider-Man and Peter Parker look like a teenager, even in costume, which really was a novelty at the time. He wasn't big and buff, he was awkward and skinny, even insectoid sometimes. Meanwhile, his penchant for psychedelic, anxious, paranoid, mentally intense imagery made him a natural for Doctor Strange. Sometimes his backgrounds look like he's bringing Kandinsky or other abstract expressionist artists right into the crummy newsprint of 1960s comics. He was a really intense and interesting artist. He left Marvel in 1966, and while he would work freelance until 1998, he became increasingly eccentric, working more and more on his own objectivist projects. That's all he does these days, and he refuses to draw any of his Marvel characters. Then there's Jack Kirby. I just, look, I, I can't, I can't do, I can't do him justice in two or three minutes. Kirby is, uh, Kirby was an experimenter with the page since the earliest days of his work in the Golden Age. But by his days at Marvel, he's doing amazing work in a more straightforward panel structure, just with motion and the composition of his characters. He was also a workhorse. To think about how many books he was doing and how good he was is almost inconceivable in the modern production process. And while he's best known for his action and his insane machines, my god, the machines, he was also capable of drawing lovely emotional moments, especially in the most unexpected places and characters. Kirby deserves his whole own deep dive, and uh, obviously I'm going to give it to him someday soon. Uh, he would leave Marvel due to contract disputes, especially over the lack of credit he received for his contributions, and would even join DC Comics in 1970. However, he would return to Marvel briefly in 1976. He passed in 1994, and I unequivocally think he's one of the most important American visual artists in any medium in the 20th century. There's also Stan Lee, but you know Stan Lee. He's hugely popular and immensely famous, so I don't feel like I have to cover him too much. So that's the Silver Age. In his book of Comics and Men, Jean-Paul Gabier writes, Silver Age superheroes did not embody a return of American comic books to their own wartime past, but rather a new sensibility in popular culture. Marvel, and to a lesser extent DC, propagated a new genre, tapping all the resources of ambient discourse about youth, middle class, nuclear power, the space race, the grand visual design of Hollywood blockbusters such as Cecil B. DeMille's 1956 Sword and Sandals epic The Ten Commandments, and a scientific imagination still largely absent from television programs. I think that's pretty succinct about what changes about the superheroes and the optimism of the Silver Age. But hopefully the context I provided for that quote has been helpful. So, while all of this was going on in the mainstream industry, an entirely new genre was bubbling up from underground. But that's next time. See you then.